you. Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to get started with our first panel. My name is Jeff Green. I'm the director of the Henri Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy. Welcome to our conference on reverberations of inequality. Uh, we at the Mitchell Center are engaged in various forms of programs, all based around the promotion and study of democratic values, ranging from the fostering of scholarship to the holding of public events that bring together a broad, inclusive audience to discuss and debate issues pertaining to democracy. We've been in existence for 12 years now, um, and our single biggest initiative continues to be the year-long series of events we do on a single theme each year. And you're here for the opening event of our 2019-2020 year on inequality. When the executive committee with whom I have the pleasure to work uh, decided a year and a half ago that we wanted to do a program on inequality, we were motivated, I think, first of all, by the sense that inequality is a very real and growing problem, both in the US and in other liberal democratic regimes across the world. The statistics are quite drastic. Um, studies have shown that in the US, for example, from the 1970s till today, a period when the US economy has almost tripled, the real wages of the bottom half of the economic distribution have basically flatlined. Um, a study in the Quarterly Journal of Economics from 2016 found that between 1986 and 2012, a period when the U.S. economy almost doubled, 99% of those gains went to the top 10% of the economic distribution. But as the program developed over the last year and a half, thanks to Annette Leroux's leadership, it became clear that we weren't only going to be interested in income and wealth and um, mere matters of economics. The problem of inequality is much more uh, direct and palpable and visceral than issues pertaining to our bank accounts. We see it every day as we go around town and notice people in radically different stations. We experience it as we contemplate our educational opportunities for our children and political opportunities for ourselves. We can't help but reflect it, it seems, in the way we comport ourselves and our bodies and our manner of speaking. And we're increasingly aware that even our health itself is affected in serious ways by inequality. And we hope in our conference and in the year-long series of events that will follow, we'll be addressing these reverberations of inequality beyond the economic realm, both to further understand the problem, but also to uh, identify uh, ways to address it. Um, but we never would have pursued this theme on inequality if we didn't have a leader to guide us. And very quickly, um, a year and a half ago, that leader became Annette Leroux. Annette is the Edmund and Louise Kahn Professor of the Social Sciences here at Penn, where she's a professor of sociology. And as many of you are aware, she is a leading voice in scholarship on inequality, with special focus on the family and, and on education. I should also say that Annette has a very well-deserved reputation here at Penn as being someone who can bring people together in effective, happy, and fruitful collaboration. So I want to thank her at the outset for her leadership in bringing us to this point and for the year-long series of events that will follow upon this conference today. Welcome to you, and I'll turn this over to Annette. Thank you very much. Well, since the colonial era, America has been unequal, and, uh, but the amount of inequality has really waxed and waned over time. And we've entered a period, as Jeff just said, of growing inequality. And, but really, a lot of the conversation is often about the economic dimensions of it. But in the conversation today, as Jeff indicated, we really want to look at the broad, to broaden the conversation, to look at the dimensions and the way in which it, has, it reverberates through social life, including health, as the panelists this morning, education, barriers to inequality, work, neighborhood, um, politics, and the policy arena. Um, we want to acknowledge the generous financial support of the Graduate School of Education, the School of Public Policy, the Departments of Sociology, Economics, Political Science, Penn Law, the Population Studies Center, and the School of Arts and Sciences. And of course, um, it was a pleasure to be a program chair because we had a fantastic committee. And I want to take a moment just to thank uh, Regina Austin from the School of Law, Martha Farah from Psychology, Eric Ords from Wharton, Julie Lynch from Political Science, and particularly the hard work of um, Jeff Green, the director of the Andrew Mitchell Center, and the many uh, wonderful and wise decisions of Matt Roth, who really worked tirelessly to make this day happen. Please join me in thanking them.
So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Martha Farah, who's the Walter Annenberg Professor in the Natural Sciences and Psychology Department here, and she's going to chair our panel. We have a monthly workshop, which are the third Thursdays of the month, and we have a fabulous set of speakers, which uh, Matt very graciously put up and I forgot to mention. And uh, please, please welcome people. They're free and welcome to the public and stu for your students and undergraduates. The first one is in October. Thank you. Well, it's been said, if you have your health, you have everything. But it turns out that whether or not you have your health depends on how much of some other things you have. People with more money, more education, more power and prestige have better health. And these are not small effects. Um, Professor Chetty, who's here somewhere or will be arriving, um, recently published a study showing that the life expectancy of people who made it to age 40, um, if you look at the difference in expected years of survival beyond that, for the very wealthiest and poorest Americans, the gap in longevity is 15 years for men and 10 for women. Now, he was contrasting extremes but I recently read um, in the New York Times about um, a government uh, accountability office report um, finding that the poorest 40% of women, so not an extreme group, actually have lower life expectancies than their mothers did. So the first panel is going to deal with this very foundational um, aspect of well-being and justice, um, health disparities. Um, let me just say a little bit about the timing to you and to remind the panelists. We're going to have three talks in a row of about 20 minutes each, and you'll see me waggling five fingers when you have five fingers left, um, followed by open Q&A. Um, so let me now introduce the three speakers. We're going to begin with uh, Chloe Bird, who is chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Forum and a senior sociologist at the RAND Corporation. Um, her focus is women's health and the determinants of differences in men's and women's health and health care. She's also professor of sociology and policy analysis at the Pardee RAND Graduate School. We will then hear from Elaine Hernandez, who is a professor of sociology at Indiana University and works on the structural forces that contribute to social inequalities in health. She asks questions like, why is the association between socioeconomic status, gender, race, ethnicity, and health so enduring? How do these social inequalities in health emerge and persist across generations? And finally, we're going to hear from Bruce Link, um, professor of sociology and social policy at the University of California, Riverside, who works on health disparities by race and ethnicity, as well as socioeconomic status, the consequences of social stigma, bleh, stigma for people with mental illnesses, and the connection between mental illnesses and violent behaviors. So, Without further ado, I give you Chloe Bird. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Um, our charge for today is to look at uh, the implications of inequalities, why they matter. Um, I actually got into research initially to look at gender stratification in the labor force, in the home, how differences in men's and women's lives matter. And uh, I found that I was in a lot of discussions or debates with economists over how much money mattered. Um, so I started looking at health, because you couldn't argue that women weren't as healthy because it wasn't very important to them. Um, it just didn't matter as much. 
Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is what do we know about health and healthcare, and how do we know it? What's actually evidence-based, and what's just agreement? What are the gaps in what we know, and what's actually been studied, uh, particularly in women's health? We have a much larger evidence base in men's health. Um, and what can we do as researchers? I always end with a call to action. Uh, what can we do uh, to close the gaps? Um, I don't believe talks should go like a mystery, so I'll tell you what, what you're going to hear. Um, the population samples make better science. Um, we can't generalize from studies of just one group to everyone else and necessarily understand what it takes to address health, uh, whether that's in terms of medical interventions, um, behavioral interventions, or larger social policies. That asking better questions, doing better analysis makes better science, and that half right can't be the answer. So there are a variety of sex and gender gaps in health. Um, there's decades of research demonstrating differences in men's and women's health. The adage uh, is women get sicker, but men die quicker. Um, this, this refers to the fact that men get more life-threatening illnesses earlier in life, especially cardiovascular disease. Women get more autoimmune-related problems. A lot of this is biological in origin, at least potentially. We don't get to study people who weren't in a social world, and, and we know that that wouldn't be the same anyway. Um, but a lot of this has a biological origin. However, not everything you see that are biological differences between adults were purely biological in origin. Um, it's led to a lot of uh, justification of it's normal for things to be that way. Um, it's not necessarily normal or consistent for things to be that way. Um, the patterns of disease for mental as well as physical health differ. Um, we long thought that uh, women, because they had more depression and anxiety, had worse mental health than men. It turns out they have different diagnoses. They don't, on average, have worse mental health. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the way we do research, the, way we, the questions we ask about what we know and how we know it, ends up baking some of these differences into health care, where there are assumptions of what's normative um, what, what's the way we would just expect it to be, and what's actionable. And the same thing happens with policy. So the way we do research matters because when we study predominantly men, we get answers that are best for men. And we have about 100 years of research, a lot of which, uh, especially up until the 1993 NIH Revitalization Act, which required including women in research, was done on men. And in fact, even the mice and rats were predominantly white and male. <laughs> so, animal justice, people. Um, it, it turns out it was, it, it was a decision that made sense at the time um, that you got different results when you studied females. But the conclusion was, but we know why. It's those cycles. We just have to study a lot of them to understand. Um, so it'll be much easier, we'll just study men. Um, not exactly the best uh, conclusion, as it turned out. So we have these decades of research, even in mental health, where the, it's re observational research, it wasn't intentionally se selecting men or differentially selecting women. There they were studying treated populations. Seeking mental health treatment is a sign that you need mental health treatment. Um, and women were more likely to seek treatment than men. And then they generalized from what they were looking at, depression and anxiety, and came up with a conclusion that stood uh, until the 80s and 90s, that women simply had worse mental health than men, and, and why wouldn't they? You know, it's hysteria, all of these good reasons why women just had worse mental health. Um, but our understanding of diseases across mental health and across physical health have been shaped and at times distorted by making a, a, a description of what we were looking at based on one group and then generalizing. So our understanding of cardiovascular disease, our understanding of heart attacks um, is, is based on what we were seeing in men. So men have typical presentation with heart attacks. Women don't present like men. Women have atypical presentation for heart attacks. And it's true for uh, Asperger's, being on the autism spectrum. And it's true for many other diseases and disorders. Um, not a problem if we figure that out, if we're actually aware of what we're doing and what we're measuring and how our categories shape things. Or if we go back and label the articles when we look back and do a literature review and say, we know this in men. 
We haven't done that. So we have differences in typical presentation. We have differences in, in what we understand and what we've learned to treat. Now, I'm willing to grant that potentially, my thing wants me to walk now, um, <laughs> potentially no one planned to know less about the health of women. It was just too complicated. We didn't have the computing power at one point in time, or it would take too many animals to study both, and they knew they were getting different results. Um, but they believed they understood why. They believed this was generalizable and that women were kind of like small men. Um, <laughs> but the, the differences were all assumed to be noise. It was all assumed to be um, something that was clearly understood, and, and we, maybe we'd get to it later. On top of that, we had the DES and thalidomide um, disasters, where medication was being given to women um, in research and, and in practice um, that had terrible teratogenic effects, um, led to miscarriages, led to a tremendous number of birth defects. And the conclusion, this was just as we're having a rise in human subjects uh, requirements in how we were going to protect people in research. Um, the conclusion was, let's make sure that never happens again. And the sometimes what happens when you say, let's make sure that never happens again, is you unintentionally make sure that happens again. <laughs> um, in, in this case, the conclusion was, let's make sure that pregnant women can't end up in studies. Seems like a good idea. They put women in the category with children and the mentally, as it was described at the time, incompetent. Um, unable to consent to these kinds of research. It wasn't just women who were pregnant or women who said they wanted to be pregnant or women who had a chance of being pregnant. It was pretty much all women of reproductive age. And you couldn't say, I'm not in a relationship, I'm not getting pregnant, I'm never doing that. It didn't even make sense to them. Uh, or you couldn't say, I'm a lesbian, it's not happening. Also, it wouldn't have made sense at the time. Um, some studies were done on nuns, very generalizable group. Um, but we, we end up not only not knowing a lot about what women can take in pregnancy, because we have to just go out and follow the population data where there's need, but we end up not knowing a tremendous amount about women's health in general, about whether interventions even work in women. The other place where our assumptions matter, and I've mentioned this before, is failure to, dis to, to distinguish between where there's agreement, where it's understood, um, and where there's actual evidence. And this happens when there's a prevailing theory, when there's a norm, when there's an understanding of how something works. Um, it's very hard to go in and get funding to challenge that, to go in and look at women, because the, the, the response you get is often, we, we know this is pretty good, this actually works. Uh, oh, you'd need some evidence in order to do that. Oh, actually, you need more evidence than you have right now to do that. Oh, you want to systematically look at everything. You may be on a fishing expedition. We need to cut that off. Um, so there's, there's a problem in being able to, to make the case to challenge the assumptions. We also have had over-reliance on adding some women subjects. After NIH, uh, the Congress passed the NIH Revitalization Act, the expectation was we'd start doing research and looking at whether results mattered for women. Um, and as one of the congresswomen said, we told them to put the laundry in the machine. We didn't know we had to tell them to turn it on. <laughs> so what, what happened is we include some women and then we say the results apply to women. There is no standard or expectation that you actually analyze whether the results apply similarly to women as they do to men. Um, if we don't do those analyses, we don't actually find out whether there's evidence of a difference, what it would take to do a study that's powered to look at it, um, to determine what do we do for the people who it wasn't working for. Um, it just all gets swept under the rug. Um, the other part that happens, a problem, is there's insufficient data collected before, during, and after the treatments are adopted. So something goes to market, we actually need to follow what happens when we go out and start putting it out um, into the population. We need more longer-term research. Now, better research can address these bias assumptions. Um, as I mentioned, it was longer assume, long assumed that women had poorer mental health than men. Um, but Ron Kessler's groundbreaking national population studies, which have been, since been reproduced around the world in the world mental health work, um, shifted the understanding of the prevalence of mental disorders. 
uh, and their distribution, we found consistently that there are um, patterns between the, the disorders that men experience more acting out, uh, the disorders women experience, which look more like self-blaming and retreating. They get their different ramifications in the world of how you behave around those. Um, but we understand those better now. We still aren't just studying all of the differences in treatment, but we've made progress. Now the good news is that by addressing these gaps, we can do research that will inform the treatment of health and, well, uh, and illness in women and girls. It will help us analyze the mechanisms and how they differ and where we need to intercede, which may or may not be medically. The same issue applies in policy. Um, but we, we can also identify barriers to diagnosis or treatment or positive outcomes. Sometimes the barriers to diagnosis are simply that we defined what a case is based on men and we still haven't learned enough about what a case is for women. Uh, women, for example, have more silent heart attacks. How are we gonna capture that? What is it we're gonna do in order to understand it? But ultimately, the knowledge about human health, disease, and responses to treatment will improve the health of men as well as women. At least if you believe that we can improve the health of humans by studying mice and pigs and other animals, I'm pretty sure part of what we learn about women can be helpful to treating men. And we've always done that in terms of treating women. The, the first studies that, that showed that there was a benefit to estrogen in uh, protecting from cardiovascular disease were all done in men and then generalized to women um, without doing enough research on the women. Uh, so we had to retract that later. But all of this requires the same basic approach of improving our models, improving what we're studying, what we're looking at, uh, in terms of the influences on health disease, recognizing what we know and what we don't know, and asking better questions. Because half right can't be the answer. We need to be doing the work on women. Um, I'm focusing on what happens here in the US, but this, this applies globally in uh, what are often much more drastic examples. Uh, for example, women have more heat deaths in a lot of the world, uh, climate related. Um, because women cook indoors, because in many parts of the world, including India, uh, for a lot of women, there's no indoor plumbing. There's no place in which to go and relieve yourself during the day, and it wouldn't be safe to do so. So the women, not only are they wearing heavy um, conservative garments, uh, and they're indoors, and they're cooking with, uh, as you probably all are aware, low quality fuels, but they drink less water during the day so that they don't have to go out until the night. So this plays out in drastic ways. Um, and in the US, it plays out in terms of really high rates of um, maternal mortality. Um, so when we look at sex and gender, um, it's easy when we study animals. We're studying biology. The, the in vogue term has shifted to gender, but you're not. You're studying uh, sex. You're studying something um, inherent. Um, but when we study people, people are born into a world in which people, someone responds differently. Even you will respond differently being handed a baby based on what your presumption or what you are told is the biological sex of that baby. People's lives they're interacted with their entire life on how you grow. Now, in this model and in most of the research, I'm talking about the simple case where it's binary. Um, I'm very interested in the health and well-being of sexual minorities, including those who are not XX or XY, those who are transgendered, such as one of my own family members. But it is, we are so far behind in studying the health of women that this is where, where we're starting. There are both genetic diseases um, that are sex specific. The easiest case, if you don't have one, you can't get cancer in it, All right? That's, that's a sex specific disease, as opposed to breast cancer, which some men get. There's sex linked diseases, such as uh, hemophilia, which are not exclusively in males, although most of the cases are. Um, on the gender side, in addition to there being primarily uh, men and women historically treated in specific ways, in other cultures there are three, four, even seven genders. Those may have uh, ramifications for what people's lived experience is, what kinds of roles they're exposed to, and how it plays out. In human beings, these all interact, and they shape risk in different ways um, that expand the biology. I'm going to skip ahead. Um, we don't get to totally separate these out, but I want you to think about the ways in which your biological sex ends up shaping your exposure 
uh, and the impact of, of uh, social factors. Um, an example being women live longer than men. Women live longer than men, and therefore they are more subject to uh, poverty in older age, in part because we have policies designed to treat us the same. Um, and cost of living is a, a, uh, adjustments that are even. Living under a cost of living that's, that's um, a little less than flat um, ultimately has an impact over 10 or 15 years in retirement. Live seven or eight more years than that, it has a much bigger impact. We treat them the same in terms of co-pays for insurance, but women have more diseases and they have more co-pays because they have more visits, they have more medications, um, and they're living into older age. So they've got more out-of-pocket expenses with a, low, a smaller denominator of income in the first place. Um, on the flip side, our social roles end up shaping um, the biological impact. Consider, for example, workplace uh, child care. You can, uh, you can easily imagine how that's going to impact women more than men because women are more likely to be primary parents. They're more, likely, they're more likely to be single parents. They may be more likely to have a child at their workplace than are uh, men. But women are also, who are, have their child at their workplace, are more likely to continue breastfeeding. And it can lower their risk of cancer subsequently. So it ends up shaping the biological. These things paths get very convoluted. Um, so in general, both the internal system from the DNA um, up and the external system, our, our behaviors, our families, um, our, our social networks, the places we live, and the air quality all end up shaping the health and interacting. And this is cumulative over the life course. I'm going to skip ahead. Um, I want us to think about the differences in the ways we test what we know when we're just building incrementally around the edges of what is well known. Um, there's a different standard there than when we're actually exploring. When you say we actually know, we've only studied in a specific population, we know how this works in this one group. Um, there's a different approach we need to go and understand it in another group. Um, it may be much more exploratory. Uh, for example, if we base our understanding of how to intervene and reduce maternal mortality on fantastic studies coming out of Vermont and Oregon, um, they may not give us the answers of how to intervene in a much larger African American community in urban settings such as in Philadelphia. Um, they weren't in those studies. We don't actually know the generalizable information. So to ask better questions, we need to think about, is the foundation solid? Do we know what we think we know? Do we know, how do we know what we've agreed on? Um, what are the gaps in the evidence base? And are we aware when we're generalizing beyond the evidence, um, which unfortunately often happens because we don't study diseases in much older adults frequently, and women are much more likely to be those older adults. So the question is, are we including the population samples, testing the assumptions, assessing whether the mechanisms actually operate differently in females and males, whether the interventions are effective in women and girls or men and boys, and reporting the, uh, the evidence such that other researchers can carry forward with it. Now, the Reacher's Continuum, everyone will bring up the scientific method. Uh, this is an NIH um, illustration of it, uh, with an understanding that we've learned how to do this right. And one of the problems is when we do this right, we do cl randomized clinical trials that take the youngest people with a disease, the least complicated, so we really know what's going on, um, and generalize from them to the rest of the population. Now, when we do that in men, the population we study below the age cutoff is fairly similar to the overall population with the disease. When we take that same standard with women, um, for diseases that have later onset, such as cardiovascular disease, which has killed more women than men since the 1980s. Um, older women, but it's killed more women. Um, we generalize well beyond the data. We don't have as much overlap. So where we end with the evidence base, even if we get to the point where we're including women, is not the same place in terms of treating the majority of women with the disease. So can inequalities researchers catalyze better science? We can when we bring what we know about inequalities research, not only to reporting it out, but to improving uh, biomedical research, to evaluating uh, policy, to testing the assumptions. Um, and the findings can then shift the fields and shape the science. 
So as I said, better population samples produce better science, better questions and anal analyses make better science, and half right can't be the answer. We're not trying to just generalize from men to women. We're not trying to just treat the average person who has one testicle and one ovary. Um, they're not common, but it's true on average. Statistics can't lie, right? Um, we need to actually be doing work that tells us better than one size fits all medicine. It doesn't work in underwear. It's not what I want in health. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here and particularly to be on the panel with both Chloe and Bruce. Um, thank you for your patience. My voice is a little bit off. I'm fighting off a beginning of the semester cold. It's an occupational hazard that we all face as, the, um, as we're coming back together. I recognize that this is a very interdisciplinary crowd, and so I thought that it would be useful to orient you to um, my perspective. I am a medical sociologist by training, but I also have training in public health administration and policy and health demography. So what I'm going to be talking about today, um, I have one objective, which is to use two examples to demonstrate how universal policies may lessen health inequalities. So I'm going to start out by just really orienting um, us to one particular example here. What I'm going to show is the U.S. prevalence of smoking by education among people aged 25 to 30 over the second half of the 20th century. And it's particularly important that we focus on this age group for two reasons. First, if you're going to observe changes in smoking, it's going to be earlier in the life course. And also, this is at the point when most people have completed schooling, um, particularly for this time period. So what we see in the middle of the 20th century is that there are very few educational differences in smoking. This is nothing new. Once um, researchers reached a consensus about the hazards of smoking, we do start to see the emergence of an educational gradient in smoking behavior. And then in 1964, the US Surgeon General had enough evidence to put out a call, a warning, and we see a very clear emergence of the educational gradient in smoking behavior. This is not new, I am sure. You are all very familiar with this, and we've seen this replicated in many other settings. So what I was particularly interested in is what's happening right here. What's happening when we start to see the emergence of this educational gradient in smoking behavior? And so I'm going to use two specific empirical examples to talk about this. And for the first, I'm going to talk about clinic level protocol for disseminating new health information. And in the second, scale that up and try to understand whether we see similar processes when we look at city level tobacco clean air acts, also known as smoking bans. So to start out with the first example, disseminating new health information. What I did is I um, went into four clinics um, and these were clinics that provided obstetrics care, and I enrolled women who were pregnant for the first time. And this, um, they were called prima gravida women. This could include women who had a spontaneous or an elected abortion, meaning they may have had a miscarriage. But the idea is I wanted to capture an, uh, women who were engaging or who were, um, uh, had, were pregnant for the very first time because I wanted to understand how they were responding and how they were making these decisions for the very first time. So we had these um, pregnant women from four clinics. I had my team in these clinics over, um, for over a year and they filled out a survey questionnaire at the beginning of their pregnancy so they could get some baseline information and then from each monthly sample I stratified them by educational attainment and I selected a random subset to participate in in-depth interviews and then I um, I interviewed their healthcare providers as well. Now, it's really important, I want to kind of orient you to, to remember that, it, that we need to think about, we need to use broad 
um, census data or survey data at the national level, but we have to really think about what's happening at the micro level. And this is one of the benefits of this particular design, that I was able to collect information at the clinic level, at the, at the patient level, and then at the provider level. And by collecting information among pregnant women and their providers, I could get at that patient-provider interaction. I could kind of triangulate what is happening when women are talking about new health information. So what were the health behaviors that I focused on in this study here? Uh, this was taking place in the early 2000s, 2009, 2010, and women at this time, and they continue to be pregnant women, are really bombarded by health information, they, and um, they're guilted quite frequently. They're told that they need to behave in a very specific way. Um, so what I'm focusing on are two specific supplements. The first is vitamin D, and then the second is omega-3 fatty acid. So if you could imagine uh, women who are, who are pregnant, and this is um, staying back in 2009, uh, omega-3 fatty acid really represented the forefront of knowledge that women could take a prenatal supplement for omega-3 fatty acid and they could help with the brain and the cardiovascular development of their fetus. And for vitamin D, there were a lot of um, studies ongoing about the benefits of vitamin D. What is it that we can do to really give the best start to the developing fetus? So I want you, just for a moment, I want you to set aside the link between these particular health behaviors and broader public health impacts. And I want you to think about this as a specific example. How are people responding to this new health information? And how can this, these micro-level interactions help inform what is happening at the population level? So what did I find? I'm going to separate these um, by these two health behaviors and at the level of the patient, the provider, and the clinic. Uh, and the o O3FA is indicating uh, omega-3 fatty acid. So as you might anticipate and based on a, a vast array of research and a number of disciplines, it was the well-educated women who were inquiring about omega-3 fatty acid. And in turn, the providers acted in concert. They were much more likely to initiate a conversation about omega-3 fatty acid with these women who were highly educated. So I want you to, to just, um, for a moment, think about what these interactions look like and how they would differ for a woman who is very well educated versus a woman who is not well educated. The providers started to talk about a specific stereotype. They would say that they knew this woman before, she, before they um, even sat down. It was the woman who had read the entire book about pregnancy and had a number of questions that they wanted to ask the provider. And so you could see this cycle where women who were uh, in some ways socially privileged, I talk about educational attainment, they were the ones who were getting far more information about omega-3 fatty acid. And then at the clinic level, there were really no protocol people were not required to talk about omega-3 fatty acid. Now, this is what happened in three of the four other clinics when we, when we think about vitamin D. Most of these conversations were initiated by the patient if they had questions about vitamin D, and then you could see the providers start to respond and be more likely to talk about vitamin D with those particular patients. Now, I also want to point out that there is the issue related to cost that providers specifically mentioned they were more likely to talk about it or to discuss these prenatal vitamins with women who they felt were able to afford the prenatal vitamin and who were more likely to follow through and take that prenatal vitamin. So when I was in the field, what I noticed is there was one particular clinic that was a little bit different, yeah. called this Clinic A. And in this clinic, there were very few discussions among patients. Patients really didn't ask about it. They didn't talk about vitamin D. And this was because providers, and in particular the intake nurses, asked all women or they talked about vitamin D with all women. And what they did is they tested all women at the start of their pregnancy. So if you're unfamiliar with prenatal care these days, what happens is people come in for a prenatal appointment, they receive a plethora of information, a big folder, and they go through, um, they, they have their blood drawn and their blood screened. At this time, women um, in this particular clinic had their blood drawn for vitamin D. And this was because one particular midwife, um, she decided that she was particularly concerned about low vitamin D levels. This was at a higher latitude. She wanted to make sure that all women had adequate vitamin D levels. And so there was a very formal protocol in clinic A. And they said, we're going to test everybody in the clinic. 
Now, two things happened. What you might anticipate, there were no educational ingredients in um, vitamin D intake. But also, we see these differences in that patient-provider interaction. Patients were not initiating conversations because it was well-covered territory. And the same for the provider. The provider was not using their time to try to determine if the patient would be able to take that vitamin, they could prescribe it. And even women who were on Medicaid in this state and in a number of other states, for, if you prescribe medication like vitamin D, it is covered. Um, by Medicaid, so and it was a, it's a very low cost vitamin, and so you really see very few inequalities, and you see um, in terms of the differences, you see less time between the patients and providers talking about this particular vitamin. So this got me thinking. This is happening at the clinic level. Could this scale up? Could this be something that we could be seeing in other institutions, in other settings? Um, and just as an aside, if you want to read a, a bit more about this, this is in Social Science and Medicine. So then I moved on to another example, and this is where I'm looking at smoking bans, or city level tobacco clean air acts. I wanted to understand, do we see the same processes once we implement another type of uniform or universal policy, the smoking ban? And, my, and this is with co-authors, um, with Mike Volo, with Brian Kelly, and Laura Frizzell. And we had some questions. Is it possible? And now this is a, this is a bit of a different example because based on that first uh, figure that I showed you, we, we, start to, we are starting out with a gradient, with a very clear educational gradient in smoking behavior. So is it possible that when we um, instituted these smoking bans that that gradient in some way narrowed? And so we could anticipate this. But on the other hand, we know that public health officials employed or they used um, denormalization to try to get people to quit smoking. And research showed that in the early years, it was the highly educated people who were more sensitive to these denormalization processes. They were more sensitive to the fact that smoking is now stigmatized. And so what we see, and this is a um, Barbara Ehrenreich, she wrote a piece for Slate saying that smoking bans are a war on the working class. So what is it about, so we have to think about the fact that these smoking bans not only are employed at, the, at a universal level or at a uniform level, they are also using de or stigma, they're using denormalization and these stigmatization processes. So we were very cognizant and we were very um, careful to think about this. On one hand, it could be the people who smoke more from time one, um, they are the ones who are more likely to quit smoking once the smoking ban is implemented. And that we see a narrowing of the educational gradient in smoking behavior once we institute a uniform or universal policy. And this aligns with um, not only what I found in the clinics, but other research using nationally representative data, which found that when states passed uh, laws on uh, seatbelt laws, they reduced inequalities in seatbelt related injuries and the same for folate. When we added folate to our foods, we started to see a reduction in inequalities in folate status. So this is, this is something that we see in other settings. And so this is on one hand what we could anticipate, but we could also anticipate that because we are using these processes of denormalization and we're really stigmatizing smoking, that we see the people who are more highly educated and who are more sensitive to this um, quitting at a higher rate, and over time, we see a widening of the gradient. So we use data from the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, which is a cohort study. It's ideal. Again, if you're going to observe differences in smoking behavior or changes in smoking behavior, you're going to see it earlier in the life course. And just to give you a sense for a little bit of our analysis, we looked at people who smoked eight or more cigarettes in the past 30 days, so approximately smoking two, twice a week, and we looked at parental and individual educational attainment because at this point, some, for, um, as you're transitioning to adulthood, it, both of these are important. Now I want to just preempt some of the questions about individual educational attainment. Uh, we were, um, what, what you see both in our research and then in my colleagues' research is you start to see that the um, education that people end up have, their completed level of education, you start to see these patterns emerging earlier after prior to completing that transition to adulthood. We use data from the American for Non-Smokers Rights Foundation, which is really a wealth of information about tobacco policy. 
And specifically, we operationalize smoking bans as living in a city where workplaces, bars, and restaurants are 100% smoke free. So really a very uniform policy. I do want to note that a number of these policies were passed at the state level, but we are looking at this at the city level. And we use individual level panel fixed effects linear probability models of smoking. So this is going to allow us to examine the individuals when they lived in a city without a ban versus living in a city with a ban, allowing us to make a more, uh, to be more confident in our causal claims about the effect of living in a city with a smoking ban. So just to give you a sense for when these smoking bans were passed, what I show here is the percentage of respondents living in a city with a comprehensive smoking ban by year from 2004 to 2011. And you can see by the end of the period of study, we have a, over half of people who are living in a city with a comprehensive smoking ban. So what do we find? What I'm going to show here are the results from, uh, for individual level educational attainment, but when we measure educational attainment as parental, at the parental level, results are consistent, and I'd be happy to discuss those as well. So I'm gonna show the predicted probability of smoking in the past month by individual educational attainment and presence of the smoking ban. What I first wanna orient you to is the very clear educational gradient in smoking. What you see here on the left-hand side are individuals who completed less than a high school degree, and then on the right-hand side, individuals who completed a bachelor's degree. So you see this very clear characteristic educational gradient in smoking behavior. Next, I want to orient you to the color scheme. Uh, for those who, uh, years when they were living in a city with no ban is blue, and then um, living in a city with a ban is yellow. But then finally, I want to draw your attention to, on the end here, we see these significant differences for those who had completed less than a high school degree, in fact, they're much more, or they're, they're smoking, the predicted probability of smoking is much closer to those who had completed a high school degree. So we take this as evidence that this is, in fact, narrowing the educational gradient and smoking behavior. And we didn't find evidence that these denormalization processes were exacerbating educational inequalities in smoking. So if you'd like to read more about this, this is forthcoming in demography. And then um, again, I want to make notes and, and point out my co-authors, Mike Bolo at Ohio State and Laura Frizzell at Ohio State and Brian Kelly at Purdue. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> we needed a little soundtrack. So future directions. I, these, these approaches merit further investigation. And this is really just a start. The first example I used was talking about access to new information or medical care. And so when we first learn about some new health information or some new protocol, we really don't have a gradient in the population already. How could we use these, these um, universal policies and implement them better at the clinic level or in other institutional settings to prevent health inequalities. The second example re um, involves restricting choice, and I am um, looking forward to Bruce's talk next because I think he's going, some of what he's going to be talking about really hits on, on this second point here, where we need to think very carefully and very cautiously about these policies and how they are um, affecting people in different subgroup populations. And I bring up this, this graph, I'm sure many of you have seen this already on the top. You can see that we have an example of equality. And this is essentially what I have been talking about today, that we would give everybody the same bike. But we recognize that in giving everybody the same bike, it's not going to work. We have somebody here who has a disability, somebody who's too tall, and somebody who's too short. That same bike isn't going to work in all of these situations. So we have to really think more carefully about moving towards equity, where we find something that is going to be better and, um, for each specific subpopulation. This is the direction that I'd like to take this research, and I really look forward to your questions and to your comments about how we move from equality to equity if we're thinking about these uniform or universal policies. And I'd like to leave you with a specific, another specific example. So in, um, and Chloe had mentioned this just briefly, we know that in the United States, maternal mortality rates are rising significantly. And the state of California has been really at the forefront of trying to address this, these concerns. What they've done is, if you haven't been following it, they have, they followed, they, um, followed all of these obstetrics cases and they realized that when women were dying, 
it was because there was an obstetrics emergency and they didn't have everything that they needed in the room. This is just one way to address maternal mortality, not the only way I'm, I'm going to point out. Um, but they would be in the room and the nurse or a healthcare provider or staff member would have to run to a different floor or they'd have to run to a different part of that floor and they'd have to get additional tools or additional equipment to try to help them and they were losing time. And they also, they did not implement the same policy for these obstetrics emergencies. So what California did is they decided to create essentially obstetrics crash, crash cart. So they didn't, every time they have a delivery, they bring in the same exact cart with the same exact information, and then they train them. And what you see in this picture here is they are, you see this is a, a mannequin, a pregnant mannequin, and they're training the staff to what to do if there's an obstetrics emer emergency. And they use the same policy in every single instance. Now this has resulted in a decline in maternal mortality in the state of California, and I think it merits further investigation. Does it narrow these inequalities that we see by race or by socioeconomic status in the state of California? So before you um, get too excited about trying to study this, I have already inquired about uh, getting these data. I serve on our Indiana Maternal Mortality Review Committee, and I've been involved with the CDC. This is not easy to, this is something, this is another piece that we wrote. Um, it's not easy to get access to these data. These data are owned by the state, and so aggregating these uh, at the federal level and trying to study this can be incredibly challenging. But it's something, again, with colleagues that we, um, we feel very strongly, and, and we wrote this piece for Health Affairs, that we need to think about who's sitting at the table when we're designing these policies. Again, thinking about what Chloe had said earlier today, when I participate in the Maternal Mortality Review Committee, we have up to 30 people at the table. We have healthcare providers, we have, um, we have sociologists, I'm often the one raising my hand talking about the social determinants of health, but we also need to have people from the community, and this is what we have on our Indiana Maternal Mortality Review Committee. We have people who have been, who have had a near miss, who have nearly died, and we have family members who have lost somebody. And, and this is what we need to do when we're having these conversations and we're designing these policies going forward. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you so much for the invitation to have the chance to come and speak to all of you. I, I imagine coming here and knowing there would be an interdisciplinary audience that perhaps I should you know, do a review kind of, of what we know about uh, health inequalities um, by socioeconomic status and race. Uh, I've chosen not to do that. I've chosen to follow from the theme of uh, how inequality percolates into different domains to think about how inequality might shape <coughs> the ways in which uh, that the kinds of evidence that we've accumulated with respect to why disparities exist. Um, so I'll get started. And consistent with the theme on reverberations, uh, the US Healthy People 2000, 2010, 2020, all proposed to uh, address health inequality. So in 1990, we had health, Healthy People 2000, and the goal was to reduce health disparities. In 2000, we had health, health, um, Healthy People 2010, who had the ambitious goal of eliminating health disparities. And then in 2010, 2020, to again eliminate health disparities. You see that the disparities haven't gotten eliminated. They continue to be there. Uh, for 30 years, we've had these goals. and have not uh, made them go, or the disparities go away. Now, one, I'm going to speak about one contributor to this uh, reverberation could be a misdirection with respect to the source of the problem. Um, this is Bruce Link waxing a little bit suspicious. <laughs> and I'm not sure whether that suspicion is fully justified, and I'm kind of tossing it out here. I'm tossing out a conjecture. And the, the thing I'm introducing with my colleague uh, Juanita Garcia is uh, the, a concept we're going to call diversion. And we say a yeah, diversion occurs when research inquiries are directed away from inequality generating processes, away from the actions of people with power and influence, to questions about the behavior and circumstances of people who are disadvantaged with respect to these characteristics. 
to ask what is wrong with them that leads to an excess in their health-related problems. And then when, when this happens, attention is effectively diverted away from the actions of more advantaged individuals and groups, successfully path providing them a path with respect to absorbing any responsibility for health inequalities uh, producing action that might be theirs to own. So when this happens, we call it a diversion. And one reason for a reverberation in the call for an end to health disparities and healthy people initiatives is the development of a canon of health inequalities research that focuses too often on the attributes of those who are disadvantaged uh, and to in, too infrequently on the behaviors of the advantaged. And to develop this concept, to begin to develop this concept, I'm going to start with uh, fundamental cause theory in which inequalities research, uh, uh, because of its focus on, on powerful and uh, well-situated people. So fundamental cause theory um, uh, seeks to explain the persistence of health inequalities in different places in different times. Um, so, uh, and we identify socioeconomic status and racism as fundamental causes. Each is related to multiple disease outcomes uh, through multiple mechanisms, not just one mechanism. Mechanisms are replaced then in different places and at different times so as to reproduce the fundamental cause relationship. So here is a diagram of what I'm talking about. The fundamental causes over there on the left, and then this idea of replaceable mechanisms. So the idea is that if one mechanism is blocked, a new one comes along to express the relationship, to reproduce the relationship. And this is our rationale for call, calling the uh, cause that does that the fundamental cause, so that the idea is that if we block this mechanism, a new one emerges. So how does this happen? So this happens with respect to socioeconomic status. People use their health, uh, 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 their SES-related resources, their knowledge, their money, their power, their prestige, their beneficial social connections to scramble for health advantageous circumstances for themselves and those in their, their circle of caring, no matter what the health circumstances are. So they're flexible mechanisms. You can use them in the 19th century. You can use them in the 20th century. You can use them here. You can use them there. They're flexible, no matter what the circumstances are. And this is the idea for calling it a fundamental cause. No matter what the situations are, people can use those resources to get in a better situation. And then racism, the idea is that racist motivations of people advantageously situated in racial hierarchies reproduces mechanisms that harm the health of those who are the target of racism. And as long as that, those racist uh, 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 inclinations are there, they'll find expression. So um, the idea of slavery being in a mechanism, and Jim Crow being in a mechanism, and mass incarceration gets re re reproduced, that, that kind of an idea. So that's, that's fundamental cause, and that strongly orients us to those at the top of, of, of the socioeconomic ladder, what they're doing to produce these health inequalities. So if that theory is correct, um, agentic action of those higher up reliably creates a spread in health fortunes across places and times. Now that could sound kind of abstract, and it also could maybe for some sounds kind of challenging. So I'm going to bring it down into my own life. And so there's my wife. Now imagine my wife getting terribly sick, having a life-threatening uh, illness afflict her. So what would I do under that set of circumstances? <coughs> I'd be all over it. I'd be using everything in my power to try to address that problem that my wife was experiencing. I'd call up the dean of our medical school, connect me to the right people. I'd use uh, money I have saved up and so on to address her problem. I'd use all those resources. And in doing so, I'm moving to a different, I'm trying to move my wife to a different situation than what otherwise would be. Someone with less resources would be less able to pull this off. Um, now that's with respect to health, health related circumstance. What about the social determinants of health? Well, am I doing the same thing in that regard? Well, there's my daughter, just finished residency here at Penn. Now, if, for her, you know, I want to bring her up in a neighborhood where there's parks where she can exercise, do my best to figure out what the best foods are to feed her, and all of that stuff, using my resources there, getting her tutors to do well on those stupid tests, 
and, and all of that stuff so that she can, she, she, she can move up and get, and again, I'm generating uh, some inequality there by my use of my, my resources. Now, I give this, I've given this riff before, and sometimes people like to come up to me afterwards and forgive me for this. So one time I, I gave it and a, a physician came up and he said, tapped me on the shoulder and said, it's okay, it has survival value. It was weird and I kind of liked it, but that was one. And I did it in my class once and a minority student came to my office hours and he said, you know, you said that about, you know, really working for your daughter. I'd want my dad to do that for me. So kind of forgiving me, it's okay. And then I have my own, you know, David Brooks kind of inspired forgiveness. That would we want a society where people weren't doing what I was doing, going out there and championing those and helping those close to us? Well, probably not. So maybe, maybe okay. Forgive me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but what you and I should not let me do is to act like it's not happening with respect to telling people who don't have that, those advantages not putting my head in the sand. I should not be allowed to divert my research eye away from those kinds of, uh, of factors to allow myself what I'm calling a diversion. And then this is, could be said, I'm sure, much better by other people in this room, but the idea that I, when I act in this way, if it's not just me alone, it's other people in kind of a similar interest group are also acting in the same way. They're scrambling too, and they're kind of like me, and they collectively create institutions and procedures that help advantage folks like us. And um, so that could happen with respect to you know, zoning and our neighborhoods or the way we fund our schools, those kinds of things. And so the two kind of things I think about most here is, you know, when, when this is happening, how do I make something happen that's going to be good for me? And so I may not be intentionally going after or wanting to be ahead of other people, but it's how can I make the world good for me? Uh, and I go out and try to do that, and by doing that, I help my interest group. Uh, or how come I cannot make it happen if it doesn't work? Oh man, I couldn't get my kid into that school. My, my kid didn't get into Columbia Medical School. Whoa, I've been at Columbia a long time. I've done all this work. She didn't get in. I'm mad. What's wrong? I'll check, check with the dean, that kind of stuff. So, uh, and then, to, then you can imagine that maybe how legacies got in there. Um, but health disparities research inf infrequently, and this, this I could develop more by you know, having more evidence about it, but it infrequently investigates those kinds of issues. Actions like those I might do to help my wife, or the situations I do to put my daughter in a better, better socioeconomic circumstances, with respect to the social determinants of health, or how at least secure optimal conditions of health care access through large donations. It just doesn't characterize the research. So now I want to give you, you've just heard me talk about you know, the pushes and the, the ideas that uh, uh, people who are more advantageously situated do things that create these inequalities. Let me show you an example of how that can be kind of like let me show you an example of a diversion. It'll take a little time. It comes from a, um, from a website of a, of a minority organization that tries to deal with health disparities. And it's about the neighborhood circumstances, a power of place, a tale of two 12-year-olds. So here it goes. To get to Amara's house, you ride a train deep into Brooklyn, way past the hip neighborhoods you see on TV, ride the A train for 45 minutes in the other direction to Manhattan, and you find Ella, another bright and giggly 12-year-old, though of just a few miles separate them, their lives could not be more different, especially their opportunities for a healthy life and future. So read Amara's and Ella's story below to see uh, that where we live and how we live can profoundly affect health. So here's Amara. Amara walked just a few blocks uh, uh, through Amara's neighborhood, and it's almost like you've left New York City behind, stray dogs and chickens. Uh, uh, roam the dusty streets. You kind of get the idea here. There's piles of rubble, trash. This is Amara's neighborhood. And the simple fact that this giggly, bright middle schooler lives in this zip code will determine a lot about her health and how, how her life unfolds. Ella, on the other hand, lives in one of the wealthiest areas of the city, just a few miles away. People come from throughout New York and the world to visit the restaurants, shops in Ella's neighborhood. 
And the old rail line next to her house that has been converted to a beautiful park is always full of tourists and natives. Um, you get the idea about it in Ella's neighborhood. Uh, Ella starts out with a huge health advantage over Amara. In fact, if current trends persist, she will live six years longer. And then there's the description of Amara's neighborhood. And this is the part I want you to really focus on. Here's Amara's neighborhood. It's got all the bad things, you know? No grocery stores, uh, finding safe places to exercise, the assault rate's high, um, uh, many homes also have black mold, and so on. Here you see the description of Amara's neighborhood. And not surprisingly, uh, the description says, given all these grim statistics, they are about 40% more likely to die prematurely than the average New Yorker. Now let's have a look at Ella's neighborhood. Ella's neighborhood, most babies are born into stable families and fewer are born preterm. The schools are excellent and dependence is good. Uh, there's abundant supermarkets, safe street, green spaces. It's easy for it to be healthy in Ella's neighborhood. The percentage of adults with obesity and diabetes is less than half the city average. So there you have it. Where's the problem? On the left side or on the right side? Where do we have to do public health interventions? What's needed? Well, that's the problems in Amara's neighborhood. That's the problem. Ella's neighborhood is normal. It's good. Everything's OK there. If we want to address the problem of health inequalities, we need to ta tackle the difficult problems in Amara's neighborhood. Let's go out and help those poor people. This is half right. There are problems in Amara's neighborhood, and they need to be addressed. But let's just think about this. So that's where the website ended. Didn't have this slide. It was the slide before. <laughs> um, and, but let's have another look at her neighborhood. So Ella's grandfather was a World War II vet and got the educational loan benefits associated with the GI Bill, benefits that did not spread to black and brown people. Partly because of these benefits, he left a large inheritance of money and property to Ella's family that helped them buy into their precious neighborhood. Ella's mom attended elite college with the benefit of the legacy admission. Uh, uh, admission. Ella's family hires tax lawyers and ensure that they pay as little as possible in income taxes. Ella's family paid minimum wage salary with no health benefits to her mother of two from Amara's neighborhood to clean the house and watch Ella so both of the Ella's parents could work. Ella's mom and dad got Ella a tutor so that she could get a higher score on admissions tests than other children competing for spots in the elite schools. The family also donates to the hospital and gets perks because of that with respect to health care. Uh, so we look at that and we think differently. But it's not there in, in, on the website. It's not there in, 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 as much, I think, in the literature about health inequalities. Some of you study this as sociologists and see these things. That's why I was able to report them. But have they percolated into the health inequalities? This is my question. This is my suspicion. So where did, why, why, was that, why did that end up that way? Was it an accident? You know? uh, and I'm not sure what the reasons are. But I, it's uncomfortable. One possibility is uncomfortable for members of more privileged groups to acknowledge that they benefit from health inequalities and are coupled in producing them, like my behavior. A diversionary enterprise of, avoid, avoids such discomfort. Or moving the focus away from the action of the more privileged groups protects the benefits that such privileged groups receive from engaging in those actions. They're hidden and, as such, uh, less likely to be challenged if they're not pulled out into the research. A diversionary undertaking helps maintain the inequality that benefits such groups. So here's some examples of other kinds of, of diversions. And it's not that these areas of research aren't really important in their own right. My questions about them is their application to explaining the health disparities and how prominent they are in the literature compared to uh, 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 inquiries that bring in the behavior of more advantaged people. So I want to, their problem in these fixing. And that's very much like what I just showed you about the website. The worst health of people living in the disadvantaged communities is attributed to problems in those communities. What we need to do is research to identify what those problems are and then try to intervene on those problems. So the research in question there, the body of research is like that uh, of a, the LMR example. And sometimes the neighborhood's context research is at risk of this kind of portrayal. Now, then, 
in, when that's the focus, people of advantaged circumstances have the diversion. It's not our fault, the problem's in their community. Uh, the second one is if they could only be like us. Success and good health are, are thought to accrue from intelligence, conscientiousness, the ability to de delay gratification, traits like that. And we can help them by developing opportunities to instill such traits in, in, the, in youth. So, uh, and here there are things about the influence of intelligence and both uh, determining your socioeconomic position and also your health status so that the health inequalities aren't really what matter, it's the intelligence that does, or non-cognitive abilities like Heckman has been putting forward. And here the this, uh, diversionary content, it's not our fault, the problem lies in their traits. Now there could be some truth value to this, but to the extent that this is all we focus on or that becomes the canon that we, uh, of research that we have, it, it's not focusing on the actions of the more advantage. Bad choices is a, is a classic one. We all have choices and free will, but people from low SES origins make bad choices. They uh, eat poorly, don't exercise, binge drink, smoke cigarettes, and so on. And our modifiable risk factor approach, which if you go to the websites of organizations of the major killers, the Heart Disease Association, Stroke, Lung, and lung Cancer, Breast Cancer, and Colon Cancer, you'll see that the kind of modifiable risk factors are these kinds of behaviors. These are the kinds of things we need to do to address these diseases. Um, things from the social domain either aren't mentioned at all or are considered not modifiable, like race is not modifiable in, in one of these uh, websites without considering the possibility that racism is modifiable. But anyway, that when we do this, to the extent that this is part of the canon of the current research, the worst health of the least well-off as a result of their choices, it's not my fault. Genetic factors is another one. Substantial funds and elaborate programs of research have been mounted to address genetic factors as potential contributors to health inequalities. Perhaps the inequalities are there because of genetic differences. Um, and assessments of the, uh, of, of the accomplishments of these, of these endeavors for understanding health inequalities ha have been challenged. For example, Kaufman did a systematic review for cardiovascular disease and found only small racial differences in genome-wide searches and no consistent pattern that favored one racial group over another. And he concludes that although substantial investment in this technology might have produced clinical advances, so it could be good for learning in general, it has the, uh, thus far made little or no contribution to our understanding of population levels, racial, uh, racial health disparities in cardiovascular. And here, the content that could be a diversionary message, it's not my fault, it's nature's fault. Uh, and here's one last one. Despite people saying we've got to keep an eye on the structures of advantage, it's all too easy to leave them to, behind to ask why do some people succumb while others thrive. Uh, when people are exposed to high rates of community violence, threats, deportation, police harassment, massive loss of blue collar jobs, some of those exposed just do just fine, while others experience severe mental and physical problems. And the question then becomes, what makes some people more resilient than others? And this focus on the resilience then uh, says, what is it about them? Why do some people succumb and others continue to flourish. So again, this directs our attention to what it is about the people that have been disadvantaged by these circumstances. And if one person could survive these, why can't all of, all of us? So what do diversions achieve? Diversions direct attention away from the self-supporting behaviors of the advantage to the characteristics and circumstances of the disadvantage. Put simply, a diversion constructs the source of the inequality in them, in their traits, their behaviors, their families, their communities, their cultural orientations, their gene, and their, their presumed inability to be resilient. So we argue that health inequalities research is overpopulated by such diversionary inquiries and underpopulated by studies of the inequality generating actions of more privileged and powerful groups. By turning attention away from the inequality generating actions of more privileged groups, Diversion allows such actions, diversions allow such actions to remain hidden and unchallenged. 
And the consequences of this is that we create a canon of research focused on the disadvantage, on their genes, their traits, their behaviors, their communities, that leads people to focus on such factors when considering the causes of health inequalities and what should be done about them. And research and intervention resources are directed towards these issues and away from inequality generating actions of more privileged peoples. We offer the concept of diversions to draw attention to the possibility of such an imbalance and to push for research that focuses more attention on the, uh, on the actions of advantage groups and the production of health inequalities. Thank you. panelists for three really stimulating talks. Um, now it's time for you to pose questions to the panelists. Um, the ideal question is brief. <laughs> um, does actually contain a question. Um, and if I, if I really get my wish list, um, it, it might touch on issues that more than one panelist could respond to. Um, so, uh, and it looks like we have mics set up there. Oh, oh, Matt, Matt is going to. Uh, and also Katarina, uh, so she'll take care of that. Oh, fantastic. So please put your hand up if you would like the mic to ask a question. Somebody over there, looks like. Uh, those are really great docs. Thank you so much. Um, so I had a question about the political process in all of this. Um, it generates the agenda potentially for what research is done, um, the types of policies that are passed or not passed, and maybe is a, one of these endogenous fundamental causes in the way that elites may capture institutions. So I just wanted to get a sense from you how um, in your research you've thought about the political process and shaping the policies and outcomes you're looking at. And if you could direct us towards um, emerging research in this field that looks at the relationship between politics and health and maybe from health to politics too. Do you all want to just take that in turn? Or somebody who has a burning answer? Mm -hmm. It's interesting coming from, uh, uh, I spent a lot of time in the, in the, in the School of Public Health and uh, the relevance of all the social sciences and so I'm always an eager person to try to um, uh, incorporate from any social science about helping understand these health inequalities. And I think the point, I think that uh, I'm not exactly sure of all the things that you're uh, pointing to, but I think they're so vitally important. Um, the, one of the ideas would be that there's health is influenced by a diverse set of policies and the political process influences those uh, 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 policies, so housing and you know all that stuff. So I think it 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 it, it is something that a, people like me have to have our ears open to. I'm not sure how much it's penetrated me, or you know, and I think uh, that's one of the good things about this conference is it's doing that just that. And I think your question is is. is, is you know, I'm going to be got my ears wide open this afternoon to see what else I can bring in. Anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, okay. Chloe. So, oh, so Billy. I could say that uh, that's a very important question, and it's really integral to what we are all talking about today. I, like Bruce, cannot identify a specific example and how that would um, change some of the re some of what I am doing in my research. However, I would. I would like to think optimistically that if we use some type of uniform policy or universal policy to translate something like the latest U.S. Preventive Services Task Force research, that we can thread the needle and that it doesn't, and that we, that some of these political um, forces are not as important because we are aiming to achieve the same objective. 
Uh, and this is something that we see, for example, with maternal mortality, that we see, at least in Indiana, which we have one of the highest rates of maternal mortality, I have a, um, a representative um, who is reaching across the aisle, I've spoken with him, and trying to find some sort of policies that we can use to benefit women across the board. And so that's, I mean, I guess maybe there, there is your, your answer. That's one specific example where we can kind of make these policies because we have similar objectives. But that's not to say that other women's health issues, and I'm sure Clary could speak about this, really divide us when we think about um, how we are funding or what sort of policies we're going to implement. Um, I think the issue is, it comes back to equality versus equity and the extent to which we're willing to shine a light on did our universal policy treat everybody the same? I mean, we have uh, universal public education, um, but we have it based uh, largely on local funding. Um, there's nothing equitable there at all. Um, and then the attention um, from my work on constrained choice and from Bruce's work on uh, diversion now looks at we spend all the time talking about are the parents involved and not are the schools the same? Are the resources the same? Um, we have standards from the, uh, the US Task Force on quality measures in healthcare, on um, treating people who've had a heart attack. Um, they've got a doctor, they've, got, they've had a heart attack, they're, they're in the system of care. Um, and there's agreement that 100% of them should be screened regularly um, for, their, for their lipids. There's an agreement um, at certain levels, you should, you should be prescribed statins but we don't provide statins that have the same um, low side effects for women. It hasn't been studied, it hasn't been a priority. And so the attention uh, goes not to the work I've done looking at, there are these huge gender gaps in treatment where we have agreement what the treatment's supposed to be. Um, we don't require measures of quality, what quality are women receiving and what quality are men receiving. Um, but the attention goes to, well, the women don't stay on the statins because it causes them a lot of musculoskeletal pain. Um, or, they're, or they're worried about it because there's not as much evidence about how it works in them. Um, instead of on the problem of we could be coming up with universal answers, we could be doing the work. Um, so I think that speaks to your policies. Right. We had a question over here. First, I want to thank you for your work. Um, my question is about how the, we got institutional research review boards because of the Tuskegee mm -hmm. incident. Um, but they still do not produce designs that actually benefit the participants. Have any of you looked into the culture issues that are dealing with that? And my follow-up question, because I'm actually working on creating a community research review board, is would you be open to participating in webinars? Because your material hits on the problem. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll start on the uh, Institutional Review Board. The, the responsibilities given to the Institutional Review Board are more about minimizing risk than about maximizing benefit. Um, and so the, a lot of the design issues need to be pushed with the, the NIH. And I think you're, what you're speaking to speaks to, to what a lot of my work is about of who benefits from the research. And if we don't require um, work that looks at war different major demographic subgroups getting the same result, um, then we don't find out who benefits. And we have this long history of doing a whole lot of research in the African American community um, and providing um, the best care. Uh, as, as, soon as, as soon as we get out past that, it goes to the highest SES individuals and we don't do anything either that makes the research more beneficial to those communities or the products of that accessible. Um, because the healthcare policy doesn't doesn't pay for it, so I think there are a lot of levels at which we need to address it, and um, I, I'd like to get information on your webinars. But I, I, we need you uh, mm -hmm. pushing for what you're pushing for. Somebody on this side, yeah. Hi, um, I'm really interested in the idea of diversion that. Bruce raised, and I think it sort of applies to all three of you. I'm wondering how we get around it. So uh, I've also just written a bunch of stuff that's related to the idea of diversion and how health inequalities research very often does get um, diverted as a way of avoiding talking about fundamental causes. And so I'm wondering, when you think about how to get around diversion, what's your prescription? Is it that we should sort of move upstream and focus instead on the fundamental causes rather than talking about health inequalities at all. 
Um, is it that we should focus on getting a bigger table when we are making universal policies, right, that more people should be at the table? Is it, as this audience member suggested, um, sort of expanding the mandate of IRBs to promote equity and beneficence sort of above harm reduction? Or are there other possibilities that haven't been put out on the table yet that we should be thinking about? So, um, well, one, one thing I, I, that my making the concept or proposing the concept that, that I'm worried about is to then we'll have a tool for saying, questioning whether something might be diversionary and sort of affect the intellectual context in that way. Uh, I don't know if what I presented deserves that, but that's what I'm, th I'm thinking I'm worried about it, and I, I'm, I'm trying to propose that we have this way of talking about it now, that, and, and if we have that name for it, you know, maybe that'll help some. I don't know, that's maybe overly ambitious, but that, that um, then in terms of, I think, no, we, I think we still have to stick with the health inequalities, not just study the fundamental causes. We have to, or the uh, upstream factors are what the advantaged people are doing to produce the inequalities. But I think it always has to be integrated into whatever we do in some way. And then we don't allow ourselves to do things that are, are uh, that where we start with the, the inequality in health and then trace through all the, all the mechanisms through which it occurs, sort of forget the source. I, and I think we, we can do better at that to always make prominent where the inequality is coming from in some way in every so that we're telling the folks that are, well, letting the people that are disadvantaged by it know that what the sources are rather than having them be focused on something else. Uh, I mean, in, okay, in, I'm gonna, I want to jump in on that as well, oh, though. Sure. On, in, in my work on constrained choice theory, we, we look at the who are the decision makers? Um, one of the problems is when we do this work, it's written, it's often published in journals that mainly we talk to each other, um, or, they're, or they're aimed at clinical audiences, and they're not about things that physicians deal with. They're, they're increasingly looking at people's lives um, and inequality. Um, we need to be directing our research to the decision makers, whether that's the employers, um, schools, the institutions, the, uh, the communities, in understanding how sequelae of the policies they have in place shape health behaviors or constrain opportunity. Um, because many of the things that end up in, impacting your individual health, and this is more true the less educated and the lower income you are, um, are things that are outside of your control. Um, and you're focusing on the, some of the extra leverage that, that the highest income have in shaping where, where most others don't. Um, but I think we absolutely have to keep the attention on the in inequality. Um, but I think we have to have a much more public and detailed discussion about what is it, what produces health and what doesn't. Um, and that would include, you know, an honest discussion about what's even possible in educational opportunities um, when we stack the deck, instead of looking away from the deck and saying, well, you know, what are individuals doing? Why aren't why, why aren't these kids studying really long hours? Um, and, and not at, at some of the other issues. I mean, you didn't even bring up some of the issues of the differences in the impact of, of mass incarceration mm -hmm. on um, the, the households. And wh why, why is a, a young African-American child living in, a, in a, a, a community with lower family form, you know, structures that the white community describes as normative? Um, we, we have this pattern of drastically high rates of incarceration and disenfranchisement. That, that shape family structure. Um, oh, Jeff, there's somebody. There. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming and giving us <clears throat> very interesting talks. I have a question for the first speaker, but also to the others. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, I found that the first talk didn't really have the broader social context integrated as much, and the NIH graph <coughs> that you showed has no social context in it. So I'm sort of wondering whether we should think about the social context influencing the health of men and women similarly, 
or whether Bill and David living in those two New York City neighborhoods would, should we think about them the same way as the girls that you talked about? And so how do we integrate or think about the social, proto-social context, but also racism when it comes to thinking about the differences in health of men and women and to what extent that would influence also some of the research. So I'd like you to bring that into the proto-social context as well. Well, I think part of the social context is understanding that the scientific method is not an algorithm for how we do it right. It is, it's, 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 an, it's an idealized uh, set. And the, the NIH has tried to, to lay out exactly what that looks like. But in fact, it's, it is um, an idealized document, like the Bill of Rights, like a religious document that everybody can read differently and, and use to say, I'm right and you should do it the way I'm doing it. Um, so part of it, it comes into what, what is the position when you're challenging the status quo and saying, where will, where will the breakthrough science come from? Not only, but where will the, the, the science that, that helps us close the gaps or level the, the playing field in terms of evidence-based medicine, but where are we going to learn the most? Um, and arguably, we're going to learn the most by studying people we haven't studied before um, and by in, in, engaging with them and making a difference. So that's part of it. Um, the other part is certainly investing more in, in some of the other parts of the work that, that I'm involved in, in, in neighborhoods research, such as the, the website was talking about, where we look at the extent to which it's not individual level characteristics and individual level par poverty, but you can, you can link higher cardiovascular risk to the, even controlling for individual level, to the, um, to the neighborhood, to the community's socioeconomic status. So you look at um, southeast uh, D.C. versus Northwest uh, Washington, D.C., and we found that the same woman with the same characteristics would have more than a 20% higher risk of a cardiovascular event over um, six or seven years. Um, it's, it's not just about the individual, and I think we have to put that on the table and say, if we have a commitment, if we want to make a commitment to equity, um, we have to take into account what contributes to um, unequal outcomes. Can I? I can, I'm, I'm going to. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I can no, respond no. to this as well. In, in thinking about how we respond, and, and I hear echoes of this with the question about the Institutional Review Board as well, I think that ensuring that different voices are at the table when we're in all parts of the research process. And so what's been so fascinating about being a member of the Maternal Mortality Review Committee, for instance, is when we sit there, we're collecting these data that are going to be aggregated eventually up at the federal level. And we have all members participating. So we have women who are near misses participating just as much as the cardio, um, you know, cardiologists or the maternal and fetal medicine specialists, and they are all contributing to the development of this data. And then all of this, I think, is important is as we design these research questions. And I think it really emphasizes why we need to get into, um, to try to understand these micro-level processes, because even when I was in the clinic, I mean, a lot of these conversations that you have with patients or providers um, can really inform the way that we think about designing research at the clinic level. And I think that we could do that more in, in other institutions as well. And I, I think it's, a, it's a, a point that we need to really continue to think about, and I'm grateful that you brought that one up. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take moderator prerogative and ask a question myself. Um, and I have to preface it by saying it's, it's a pretty naive and ignorant question, um, but here goes. Um, we have been hearing about health disparities in, um, as a function of sex and gender, as a function of uh, socioeconomic status, there have been allusions to racial disparities in health. And I'm, I'm wondering how much I should be thinking of these as kind of all one big, hairy, complicated beast, and how much the mechanisms that give rise to them, that sustain them, the um, strategies that will help reduce them, um, you know, are, are uh, you know, are, are different in some important ways. And I'm sure the answer is, you know, some of both. But um, I'm wondering if anybody wants to give a, you know, sort of a 
nutshell summary of how health disparities by gender, race, socioeconomic status should be thought about in relation to one another. And um, also, are there other um, dimensions of disparity that we should be thinking about? You know, I, I don't know what those would be. You know, age, I, I, I don't know. And if it's, if it's just too, if you wanna just tell me, Martha, just go take sociology 101 and then come back when you've learned something, that's fine too. I think that given that you have a panel of sociologists, our, our quick response is that you need to think about the way that these intersect and the fact that you can't, um, you can't put people into separate categories. You have to think about how, for instance, I occupy a category as a minority and as a female um, and all of the other categories that I occupy. That being said, it's important to elevate each of these. And we have, this is one um, deficiency if I look across our panels, we have not given as much attention to race and ethnicity as we could have, and this is partly by design and partly by um, our time limitations perhaps, but I think that, that it, it's definitely something that, that we need to, to think about more, and that would be my quick response. Okay, thanks. Well, I mean, I would say one of the, one of the issues is because of that intersectionality, because, because there are these different dimensions, and age is in one, uh, being, being a member of a sexual minority is yeah. another. There, there, there are many that we can look at here um, and deserve attention. Uh, we haven't necessarily looked at the most egregious. Um, but it, the fact that they're different bases allows them all to get hidden in plain sight, and we look away from them for different reasons. So um, the consequences of uh, inequality, if you, if you look at inequality in healthcare for African Americans, um, there are researchers who will point you to, well, the, it's, it's the, what the providers do. Um, and African American providers do it too. They provide poor quality care to African Americans. See, our, our work here is done. Um, and not that the African American providers are concentrated in low resource clinics as are the African-American educators uh, in, in lower resource schools, to a lesser extent. But we actually need to look all the way up the chain and, and, and dissect the problem. Um, many of these things are in front of us so long they look normal. Um, and we, look, we normalize them with explanations instead of problematizing them. Um, and so instead of looking at barriers to, um, to, to women advancing and leading in science, we look at the reasons why women leave or why they choose to leave. Um, and so part of it is articulating the entire story of what's going on and how do we filter out and um, reify a system? How do we keep recreating patriarchy? How do we keep recreating um, racism? and, and um, stereotypes of the lower income and less educated as responsible for their circumstances. So um, is that an endorsement of there really is a, a sort of fundamental force carrying all of these dimensions of inequality forward? They're, they're, like what we yes, learn I mean, about gender inequality there's, there's, we could apply to combat social There are fundamental causes in which the advantage recreate their advantage and, and put attention away from the advantage even those of us who are studying the problems. Okay. Thank you. Can I say one, one thing sure. about that? Yeah. Um, so I think it was a great question, and it's a, it's a challenging question um, to think about. And so one of my the areas that I think about uh, is, is stigma, and there's all sorts of things that are stigmatized, and each one is very different. The stereotypes associated with them are different. The exact way that it plays out is very different. But there's also something very similar across them. There's something, there's an essence that's the same. And I think that can apply to the statuses also that, that you mentioned. And so I don't think we can, there's no way we can see them as the same. They have to be, they, they'll play out differently, but there will be some essential things that are similar across them. It's giving the answer that you said we might get. But, but, I, but, I, but, but that, that's the way I think about it. So that any time you go to any one of them, you have to think particularly about it. And then the complications of when you combine them. It's a, it's a fascinating thing to have to study. To study. <laughs> you know, I, I wish I was younger. <laughs> okay, I think one more question. Yeah. Yes. Oh, we need a mic though. I work in public health. 
And I'm very concerned about the elements of public policy right now that affect all three of your presentations. I talk about the reduction in SNAP benefits, the failure to expand Medicaid in many states, and the enormous waiver restrictions that have been put on Medicaid. I'm looking at the denial of reproductive health information, and even the stigmatization of mental health with gun violence. Mm -hmm. And so all of the pieces of research that you have, diversionary and inequity, are reflected in these major public policy things that are going to affect every one of these populations. I know there's comments periods still available on some of these, but how much of this kind of research can get into the comments to actually, and I didn't even mention the environmental uh, reduction of standards. So how much of this wonderful research that hits on all of these kinds of things can get actually into effect, you know, real economic and public policy affecting all of these? <laughs> Some of us put a lot of, of time and energy trying to get insert into those uh, into those debates, into those issues. Um, and some of the things have some interesting opportunities happening out of that. There's a push right now to expand Medicaid coverage for women after uh, giving birth from six weeks after childbirth to a full year. Um, there's we've been involved uh, all summer in these discussions of how, which policies are best to back and which are more vulnerable to differential state level acquisitions. I think the, 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 the other issue is, as researchers, it never would have been ethical to randomize uh, populations across the country to different kinds of health care policies for the poor, different levels of coverage. Um, so I feel like we have a responsibility to do the work that demonstrates what's the consequence of that. How, how many lives does it cost? What are, what, what, is the, what are all of the sequelae? Really what this series on reverberations of inequality is about um, to, to do that work. Um, but I also think that universities could make it a priority and say you know, that you should be engaged in the um, public comments around policies that your research relates to and it could be valued um, doing so. Um, that could count for something um, because what gets counted is part of what we end up doing and getting uh, you know, building our careers around. Um, I think in some places it actually goes the other way. You're kind of discouraged from being too much in the limelight. Um, there's a question of whether or not that's activism versus science. Are you neutral enough? Um, most of us didn't get into studying disparities because we were interested in being neutral. Um, <laughs> you know, but so it's shape, shaping how, how we are treated as we engage in that um, can end up making a difference. Okay, so we are in overtime, which is okay, but I'm going to ask Elaine and Bruce to quickly comment and then we adjourn. Sure. So I think that's a really important perspective and coming from public health, I would say that I have learned to focus on the long game and I would even applaud the organizers of this conference today. I think that a big part of what ends up happening when you have these interdisciplinary meetings is that you have the exchange of ideas and you really learn to push this forward. So even though some of this is a, is a small step, it's, it's moving us in the right direction. I only say one short thing is I, I, I wish that somehow there was a way to get people to write a, a white paper applicable to each one of the policies that brought the research to the people who are making the decision. I, mean, I think that would be useful. Okay, thank you to a wonderful panel and to the audience.